happiest times on earth. Last time I told you how the moon was cast out of the earth and how this affected life on earth. I can imagine that you have many questions, and we will deal with them next Saturday. Today I want to make a few more points which may raise new questions in your minds as well. As you will remember, I said that as long as the moon was inside the earth, the reproductive capacities of animals had a certain quality. Later, after the moon was thrust out, this changed. While it was enclosed within the earth, the moon provided the motherly, female qualities for the earth. Let me draw this in a general way. The moon was not located at the center of the earth, but more to one side, and there's a drawing. If you look at the earth as it is now, you will notice that on one side, where Australia is, there is a lot of water, whereas the part containing Europe and Asia consists mostly of land. In other words, land and water are not evenly distributed, but most of the land is on one side and most of the water on the other. This uneven distribution existed also in the period when the moon was still in the earth. It was lying more to one side, where the earth had the general tendency of being heavy. Of course, on this side, where it contained a solid substance, the earth had to be heavy. At that time, the fertilizing process took place in such a way that the moon, contained as it was in the earth, bestowed upon the giant creatures the forces through which they, as it were, supplied reproductive substances. We cannot say that the animals then laid eggs as such. These huge oysters were only lumps of jelly or slime that secreted a portion of their own substance. As I described them in the previous lecture, each of them may originally have been as large as all of France and have had a huge shell on which you could have walked around. Below this armor there was a slime-like substance on which the moon forces exerted their influences. As a result, a portion of this substance separated and floated by itself in the liquid earth. When the sun shone upon it again, remember the example of the dog, an eggshell of sorts was formed. This caused the slime-like substance of the oyster to expel this portion, and thus a new creature came about. We can say that the female forces came from the moon, which was inside the earth, and the male forces came from the sun, which shone upon our globe from the outside. I am here describing a particular period in evolution, the period when the moon was still inside the earth. Now imagine the following. In our time, when the moon is outside the earth, it has a different effect than in ancient times. Just as carbon dioxide works very differently when it is inside the human body than it does when it is outside, where it is a poison, as I explained last time, if you look at how animals reproduce, you will see that they produce eggs, which must be fertilized. The forces the moon used to provide when it was part of the earth, are now in the animals themselves. They bear these moon forces within them. Even when outside the earth, the moon still affects us by bestowing certain forces. I told you last time that poets know this. These forces the moon bestows upon us stimulate our imagination and enliven us inwardly. They do not affect reproduction any more, Coming from the outside, they cannot work on reproduction, but they affect us nonetheless. Try to picture now that when the moon was inside the earth and part of it, it directly provided forces for reproduction. Now, after the moon is separated from the earth, these forces are implanted in the animals as an inheritance they pass on from one generation to the next. In other words, when you look at animal eggs, you have to realize that they contain lunar forces, impulses that were also at work at the time when the moon was still part of the earth. Nowadays the moon cannot do much more than stimulate the head. In ancient times, however, it primarily affected reproduction. This, you see, is a considerable difference. 
It makes a big difference whether something is inside the earth or outside. This peculiar matter of reproduction is essential to our understanding of nature in general, since this is how animals and plants come into being. If there were no reproduction, they would all long since have died out. In order to understand nature, we must first grasp reproduction. As I said, this is quite a peculiar matter. Let me give you an example. Elephants are interesting animals. They cannot bear offspring until they have reached the age of 15 or 16. In contrast, look at an oyster, a small, slimy creature. If you imagine it immensely enlarged, you get an approximate idea of the ancient creatures I described to you before. Indeed, we can learn quite a bit from the oyster. It is not like the elephant, which must wait many years before it can bear offspring. One oyster alone can produce a million of its kind in a year. Its reproductive capacity differs drastically from that of the elephant. Well, gentlemen, the aphid is another interesting animal. As you know, it lives on the leaves of trees. We suffer from its presence because it is quite harmful to plants. Aphids are much smaller than elephants, but one aphid can produce billions of descendants in just a few weeks whereas an elephant requires 15 to 16 years before it can reproduce, the aphid needs only a few weeks to multiply at the rate of billions. There are even smaller creatures called vorticelle. If you look at them under a microscope, they appear simply as minute lumps of slime with a thread-like extension along which they move. They are quite interesting. Although they consist merely of a small lump of slime, like a small piece of substance pulled out of an oyster, they can move around. Within only four days, just one of these vorticelli can produce 140 trillion others. You could not fit all the zeros of this figure on the blackboard. The only thing that could compare with such huge numbers is present-day Russian currency. As you can see, there is a considerable difference between the reproductive capacity of an elephant and that of a minute vorticella, which can produce 140 trillion of its own within a mere four days. Here we have a very significant mystery in nature. There is quite an interesting French anecdote that appears at first glance unrelated to this matter, but in its inner significance is closely related to it. There once lived an eminent French dramatist by the name of Racine. It took him seven years to write plays like his Athalie. At the same time there lived another poet who was terribly proud of himself and said, quote, Racine needs seven years to write one play. Well, I produce seven plays in one year. Close quote. In consequence, a fable developed that went like this. Once the pig and the lion had an argument. The pig, which was very proud, said to the lion, Quote, I bear seven young every year, but you, lion, only manage to have one. Close quote. The lion replied, quote, True enough, but after all, this one is a lion, whereas your seven are pigs. Close quote. This is how Racine intended to reply to his contemporary. He did not wish to tell him to his face that his plays were pigs, but he compared the two nonetheless. For he meant to say, quote, Well, you produce seven of your plays every year, but I spend seven years on something like Athelie, which is now world famous. Close quote. Even such a fable says that it is preferable to spend fifteen or sixteen years on bearing a single young one, as does the elephant, compared to producing one hundred and forty trillion within a mere four days. We are often amazed to see how fast rabbits multiply. Compared to that, the speed at which Vorticelli procreate is actually beyond our grasp. Let us now find out how it is possible for these one-celled animals to have so many young, when the elephant requires such a long time to reproduce. As I mentioned earlier, the sun is the factor underlying fertilization. Even today it is a necessary part of fertilization. I also said that once celestial bodies are outside the earth, like the moon, they work at most upon the head, but no longer affect the organs of the lower abdomen, 
and the reproductive forces. These forces must now be passed on from one generation to the next. And yet, gentlemen, even today procreation is still, in a sense, dependent on the moon. In order to explain this, I will once more refer to the sun. You see, we must ask why it is that the elephant requires fifteen or sixteen years to bear offspring. You may know that he is a pachyderm. Well, that is the reason. The forces of the sun penetrate his thick skin less than that of the soft aphid, which they permeate completely. This is why the elephant can reproduce its own kind, only to a much more limited extent. You will understand this even better if you think of the giant oysters again. There would never have been even one young oyster if it had all been up to the sun, which shone upon the scale armor, the heavy skin. No, as I told you, the oyster secreted a bit of slime, which the warm rays were able to reach. By drying it off and transforming it, the sun fertilized the oyster and thus helped bring forth a new one. When the sun rays come from the outside, gentlemen, they can produce only shells. How is it possible, then, that they can nevertheless fertilize? In order to comprehend this connection, you have to consider something else as well. You may know that after the harvest, the farmers dig deep pits into which they pour the new potatoes. Then they cover them up. At the end of the winter, they take out the potatoes, their quality preserved. Stored simply in the cellar, they would have gone bad, but in the soil they kept well. Why is this so? This is a very interesting question which the farmers themselves usually cannot answer. Well, if you were a potato and were dropped into this pit, except for not having anything to eat, you would feel very comfortable there, because the warmth of the summer sun is preserved there. Toward the end of summer, the forces of the sun gradually extend down into the earth and are stored there. If you dig down in January, the warmth and all the other forces are still down there, five feet below the surface. This is a remarkable thing. In summer the sun is up there and gives warmth from outside. In winter its forces extend a certain distance into the earth, and from there they stream back up again. If you were a potato stored down there, you would feel quite comfortable. You would not have to worry about heating, because, first of all, there would still be the warmth of summer around you, and, secondly, the sun forces would radiate up from down below. These potatoes have a good time of it. In a way, they get to enjoy the sun now. In summer, they did not enjoy it much. It even caused them discomfort. If they were creatures with heads, they would have had a headache from the sun. But if they are granted the privilege of being buried in the earth, the potatoes can really luxuriate in the pleasures the sun now provides. From this you can gather that the sun affects life not only while it is shining directly on something, but also when its forces have been absorbed and retained somewhere. Now, gentlemen, something peculiar happens. Remember, I told you that when a being or a substance is outside the earth, it has a destructive effect. It is either poisonous, like carbon dioxide, in our earlier example, or it produces scales and hardness, like the sun. However, in winter, the sun does not work on us from the outside. It works from inside the earth, where it, its forces are stored. There it regenerates also the reproductive forces, which in our time also come from the sun, not from direct radiation, but from what is reflected by the earth during winter. This is very interesting. Similarly, if we inhale carbon dioxide, it is poisonous. But we need it in the form that is inside the body. Without it, we would not have any carbon and without carbon we would not have any structure in our bodies. We need carbon dioxide inside us, where it is beneficial. But approaching us from the outside, it is poisonous. The sun's rays coming from the outside produce shells in animals. But if the sun's rays are caught and reflected from inside the earth, then they produce life. 
and enable animals to reproduce. Now, gentlemen, imagine that you are not a potato but an elephant. You would have a very thick skin, barely allowing any of the sun's warmth to enter your body. Therefore, it would take you an awfully long period of time to bear offspring. Now, imagine you are an aphid or an oyster. In this case, especially as such a creature of the sea, your lower parts near the earth would only be a lump of slime. It is quite different for the elephant. He is completely enveloped in a thick skin, which barely allows the warmth from below to penetrate. Insects like aphids live close to the soil, on plants, and have only very thin skins. In spring they can easily absorb what the earth reflects. Thus their reproductive forces are always quickly replenished. This applies even more to the vorticelli. Because they live in water, which stores the sun forces more intensively and helps produce the 140 trillion offspring at the right time of the year. In other words, when the vorticella have absorbed a sufficient amount of sun forces from the water, they are capable of extremely fast reproduction. In our time, the earth provides its creatures with procreative energy by storing the sun forces inside it throughout the winter. Let us now look at plants. You know that some plants propagate through so-called cuttings. When these particular plants grow up, you can cut off a twig in the proper way and put this cutting into the soil, where it will grow as a separate plant. Certain plants can propagate this way. How is this possible? They can form independent life out of such pieces of themselves because their seeds are in earth in winter because their seeds are in the earth in winter. This is indeed a very important aspect for plants. If you want them to grow properly, they must actually remain in the earth throughout the winter so that they can emerge from it. Of course, there is also summer grain, but we can talk about that some other time. Most plants can grow only when they develop their seeds in the earth. Some bulbs can also grow in water, but that requires special measures. Most plants need to be placed into the earth where they can then develop their growth forces. What happens when a seed is put into the soil? The tiny grain now has the pleasure of absorbing the forces the sun has radiated into the earth. This is more difficult for animals. Those that live in the soil, such as the earthworms, easily absorb the sun forces there. This is why all animals in the soil or close to it reproduce their own kind very quickly. This is true of worms in general and particularly of those that unfortunately enter the human intestines. They propagate extremely fast and we must constantly make great efforts to hold them in check. Sometimes this requires nearly all our life forces. Plants can grow directly out of the soil and there's a drawing. They have roots below through which they push up. They develop leaves, then blossoms, and finally new seeds. However, as you know very well, gentlemen, once a plant develops blossoms, it no longer grows upward. This is very interesting. Its seed is placed into the soil from where it develops leaves and blossoms. Then the growing process stops, and the plant quickly produces seeds. If it didn't do that right away, the sun's forces would reach only the petals, which are, of course, infertile. The plant would develop a huge, beautiful blossom of many colors, but there would be no seed. This is why, at this stage, the plant hurries to produce seeds while there is time. You see, the sun has the ability to make plants pretty when its rays reach them from the outside. Flowers in the fields, for instance, receive their beautiful colors from the rays of the sun shining on them from above. However, just as the sun dries up and compacts part of the oyster into the shell, so it would eventually dry up and destroy the plants. You can see this effect of the sun everywhere on earth, especially in the hot regions near the equator. There you will come upon birds of marvelous colors flying around. They are pretty because of the sun in the sky. Their feathers are all beautifully colored, yet completely devoid of life forces. More than anywhere else, the life forces have withered away in the feathers.
The same thing holds true for plants. While they grow out of the soil, they overflow with vitality, which gradually fades away. Finally, they must gather up all of their remaining energy and focus it on the seeds. You see, the sun produces beautiful leaves and colorful blossoms, but in the process it destroys the plants. The pretty blossoms do not contain any reproductive energy whatsoever. What do plants do when you put their seeds into the earth? They do not simply cuddle into the sun-warmed soil, but extend their growth forces to the leaves. They extend them upward. These green portions are developed by sun forces, by warmth, light, and so forth. This is how the sun forces the plants get from their seeds move upward. The sun forces reaching plants from the outside, however, will destroy them in the process of creating very beautiful blossoms. The seeds have their vitality from last year's sun warmth, which was stored in them all winter long. The seeds do not come from this year's sun. That is an illusion. This year's sun creates the beautiful blossoms, but the seeds contain last year's sun forces, which were poured into the earth and which sustain the entire growth of the plant. This would not be quite so easy for animals, which depend more on the sun's warmth reaching them from the outside, from the earth, and renewing them. This is because animals do not absorb the sun forces as directly as plants do. The latter, as we have seen, also bear in their bodies and their seeds the sun's warmth from the previous summer, warmth that had been stored in the earth. This is a marvelously interesting phenomenon. If we look at it in the right way, we can say that plants and animals can procreate only through the effects of the sun. Yet the sun up there in the sky, away from the earth, is the very factor that destroys the reproductive capacity. This is just like the case of carbon dioxide. If we inhale it, it will kill us. But if we carry it inside us, it will enliven us. When the earth absorbs the sun rays, the sun's rays shining in from the outside, plants and animals are destroyed. However, when the earth can reflect back the stored sun forces to its plants and animals from the inside, they are enlivened and stimulated to procreate. We can see this in plants. They produce seeds capable of reproduction only out of the sun forces stored since the previous summer. The forces that make the new plant beautiful come from this year's sun. This is generally true. Inner qualities grow out of the past but beauty is created by the present. Well, gentlemen, as a pachyderm, a thick-skinned animal, the elephant would benefit very little from the bit of warmth and sun energy the earth reflects back. These forces barely penetrate its skin. It had to store them, as it were, in its own seed from times long past. Yes, the elephant stored moon forces, which it requires for the female aspect of procreation. The moon is now separate from the earth, and the animals bear its forces inside them. A person who disagrees with this could of course call me a stupid fellow to claim that ancient moon forces are still involved in reproduction and live in the reproductive cells, and that the procreative impulses of today originate from these old forces. As a reply, I would simply ask this person whether he had never encountered anything presently alive that contained characteristics originating in the past. I would show him a boy who was the spitting image of his father. Even if his dad had since passed away, I might come across someone who knew the man when he himself was only a boy, and who would confirm that this boy looked just like his father did thirty or forty years ago. The forces of the past are always contained in what lives in the present. This holds true also for the forces of reproduction. Whatever lives in the present originated in the past. You know that many people would consider you completely superstitious if you thought that the moon affects the weather. Well, this belief does contain a lot of superstition. However, once there were two scientists at the University of Leipzig in Germany, one of them by the name of Fechner, thought that this superstition about the moon's effect 
on weather might contain a grain of truth. So he recorded what the weather was like during the full moon phase and during new moon. He soon noticed a difference. It rained more during full moon than during the new moon phase. He found this out. This does not mean that you have to believe it. Such records are not very convincing. True science must proceed with far more accuracy. This man said, however, that someone should continue his research in order to find out whether the moon did affect the weather after all. At the same university there was another scientist by the name of Schleiden, who considered himself far more intelligent than his colleague who thought the moon might affect the weather. Quote, for heaven's sake, Schleiden said, this is ridiculous. We must, encounter, we must counter this nonsense with all our might. Close quote. Fechner replied, quote, very well. This argument could go on between the two of us for a long time, but our wives can help us out too. Close quote. You see, this happened back in the old days when the wives of university professors still followed an ancient custom and put tubs outside to collect rainwater for washing their laundry because people did not yet have running water back then. Quote, well, Professor Fechner said, let our wives settle this dispute. Your wife can put her tubs out during new moon, and mine will do so during full moon. Close quote. Of course, he believed his wife would get a lot more water. But the wives did not go along with this. They did not wish to have anything to do with their husband's science. They could not be convinced at all. Despite the weight of her husband, excuse me, despite the weight of science her husband represented, Frau Schleiden did not accept his viewpoint and did not say, quote, I can collect just as much rainwater during new moon as during full moon, close quote. Regardless of how much her husband attacked Fechner, she too wanted to put her tubs out during full moon. Still, this did not prove anything. Yet it is remarkable that even today the ocean tides are connected with sun and moon. We can definitely say that in one phase of the moon they are different than in another. There are some connections. But this has nothing to do with the idea that moonlight falls on the ocean somewhere and thus causes certain tides. When the moon was still inside the earth, it developed its various forces and brought about the tides. Up to this day, the earth has kept the remnants of those forces that rhythmically vary the water level in the oceans and has carried out the variation by itself. To believe that the moon is still responsible for the tides today is superstition. But at an earlier time, when the earth was still affected by everything, and when the moon was still inside it, then the tides were dependent on the moon. The earth still lives in this ancient rhythm, even though it is now independent of it. Thus the earth maintains an apparent dependence on the moon. Similarly, when I look at my watch and see that it is ten o'clock, I cannot say that the watch itself throws me out of this hall. In other words, the phases of the moon still coincide with the tides, because at one time they were dependent upon each other. This interdependence no longer exists, but their rhythm has been maintained unchanged by the earth. We can say the same thing about the reproductive forces, as far as they are dependent upon the moon which means as far as they represent the female aspect of procreation. It also applies to the reproductive forces dependent on the sun, that is, on the sun forces inside the earth. All animals that reproduce at a fast rate make use of the sun forces stored in the earth and are less developed. More highly developed animals, and also human beings, bear the procreative forces inside them, protecting and shielding these forces within them. A certain amount of sun energy still reaches these forces and renews them continuously, otherwise they would no longer be there. But these beings would not receive enough procreative forces out of the sun forces stored inside the earth. Plants have access to these forces because they carry up inside them what was stored in the earth through the winter until the following summer. The procreative forces of the previous year are therefore available to plants. But this is not true for the elephant. Its procreative forces stem from a time millions of years back. They are in its seed 
and have been transmitted from elephant father to elephant son. The elephant carries these forces in its body. Plants are filled with procreative forces generated in the previous year, but the elephant bears in itself forces that are millions of years old. Plants and lower animals can still use the forces recently stored in the earth, which are enormously strong. Those animals that depend on keeping very old procreative forces inside themselves, however, can reproduce their own kind only in a limited way. Let us now return once more to the time of the huge oysters. As soon as such a creature had succeeded in catching the light of the sun, it lost its inner forces and could only use those that rose up from the earth. These the oyster could absorb because its underside was soft. These huge oysters, which were as big as France, absorbed the sun forces that were reflected upward out of the earth. After all, after these creatures had metamorphosed to megatheria and ichthyosaurs, their undersides were no longer soft. Now the sun shone upon them from nearly all directions, and they had to depend upon the procreative forces they had inside them. The sun did no more than quicken these forces. Well, gentlemen, what kind of conditions must have prevailed at a very early time to endow animals with procreative forces they could not have received in a later time, when the sun's rays reached them only from the outside. There must have been a time when the sun was contained in the earth, when the earth contained more than the bit of sun forces it now preserves through the winter, for example, for the potatoes. Indeed, there was a time when the entire sun was inside the earth. Now you may object that according to physicists the sun is so terribly hot that had it been inside the earth it would have burned everything. Well, gentlemen, you know this only from physicists who would be greatly astonished if they could see what the sun really looks like. If they were to construct a balloon and travel up there they would not find the sun so very hot. They would find it filled with life forces. The heat develops when the sun's rays move through air and other matter. When the sun was still inside the earth, it was filled with life forces. Then it bestowed upon the earth not only the limited amount of life forces it provides today, but it could supply plants and animals with an abundance of these forces. At that time, the ancient oysters did not grow shells, but consisted merely of slime. Try to picture sun and moon, both contained in the earth, and oysters that had no shells but were slime. When lumps of this substance separated off, new oysters developed and so forth. They were so huge and lay right next to each other so that you could not have told them apart. What did the earth look like at that time? It looked like our brain, whose cells also lie next to each other. The only difference is that these cells die off, whereas at that very ancient time the huge oyster cells were one next to the other and the sun constantly developed forces, because it was inside the earth. Yes, gentlemen, the earth was there, and there's a drawing, and there was a giant oyster, another one next to it, and many such huge lumps of slime, which continuously propagated. Even in our time, oysters multiply at such a fast rate that within a short period of time they can have a million offspring. The oysters in those ancient days procreated even faster, Hardly had an oyster developed than it had its offspring, which in turn did the same, and so on. The older ones had to dissolve eventually. If you had looked at the earth from the outside, you would have seen that the huge mass of the earth resembled a gigantic brain, only softer and slimier than our brains. You could have observed one of the gigantic oysters reproducing its kind very quickly, and of course each offspring in turn could produce a million of its own descendants in a very short time. Clearly the oysters had to defend themselves against each other because they were all so close together. As a curious onlooker, watching from another planet, you would have noticed a huge body in space, a body filled with life. It not only consisted of millions of interlaced soft oysters, but these also reproduced constantly. What would you have seen in fact? 
you would have seen the same thing on a gigantic scale, mind you, that you see when you look at the tiny fertilized egg cell out of which human beings develop. There you see the same process in miniature. These minute one-celled slime vesicles also reproduce rapidly. Otherwise the human fetus would not be able to grow to its proper size in the first few weeks after conception. The cells are so small that they must reproduce rapidly. If you had looked at the earth at that ancient time, it would have resembled a gigantic creature that contained within it the forces of the sun and of the moon. You see, now I have shown you how we can go back in our imagination to the time when the earth, sun, and moon still formed one body. Well, gentlemen, this does, after all, differ not much from what conventional science says. You may have studied Faust or intend to do so. When Faust explains his idea of religion to sixteen-year-old Gretchen, she says, quote, This is about the same as what the priest told me, just a bit different. Close quote. Well, gentlemen, you could say that my explanation is about the same as what the scientists say, just a bit different. In their opinion, it was the sun that formed one body with the earth and the moon. According to them, the sun was huge, and as it rotated, the earth split off from it. As the earth in turn rotated on its axis, the moon split off from it. Basically, the scientists also say that the three formed one single body at one time. Then, of course, some people say that they can prove this. In fact, they demonstrate it to school children. This whole experiment, in quotes, always goes down very well. You take a piece of slightly stiff paper, cut out a small circle, and then pierce it with a pin. Next, you shake a tiny drop of oil into some water where it will float. Then you put the paper circle with the pin in it into the water and move the pin down so that the round piece of paper centers upon the drop of oil in the water. When you spin the pin by its head, tiny drops of oil will split off from the original one and rotate on their own. There you are, the scientists say. Can't you see it? This is what once took place in the world. There was once a huge ball of gas in space. It used to rotate to move around its axis and then its outer parts split off in the same way as these drops of oil did. This means that our earth split off from the sun. Close quote. You can demonstrate such proofs in schools because children tend to believe in authority and will say, yes, this was quite a natural process. There was once a huge ball of gas. When it rotated, the planet split off. We saw for ourselves how the droplets of oil separated from the large drop. But you should ask the children if they saw the teacher twist the head of the pin. You must also imagine a giant teacher who rotated the ancient ball of gas, because without him the planets could not have split off. Medieval artists drew this giant schoolmaster. He was the Lord and wore a long beard. He was the giant schoolmaster who has since been forgotten. The scientist's explanation assumes a huge rotating ball of gas but it could rotate only with the help of a cosmic schoolmaster, as it were. This is not an acceptable explanation. However, gentlemen, the idea that sun and moon were once connected with the earth, and that this entity moved by itself, was capable of rotating by itself, that idea is an acceptable explanation. A ball of gas cannot move by itself. But the entity I described could move by itself, and required no cosmic schoolmaster, because it was filled with life. Like a seed today, the earth was once a living organism and contained sun and moon in it. Both of these then separated from the earth and left their legacy behind inside the earth. Because of that, the procreative forces that once came directly from the sun continued to exist, protected inside the female and male bodies of human beings and are transmitted from generation to generation. And the animals that develop semen and eggs bear inside them the ancient sun forces, a legacy from a time when the earth still held the sun and moon inside it. You see, this is a real explanation. Only on this basis can we come to a real understanding of the world. Thus we can see that there was once a time in which both sun and moon split off in the earth. We will discuss this matter again, it may still appear a bit difficult to you, but I am certain that you will be able to understand it. Mm -hmm.